Well, I've started to uh, look at the um, exam papers. Ooh. My wife removed all sharp knives from within 100 meters of me. Order sleeping pills were thrown down the toilet before I could get hold of them. Uh, point number one, which applies to so many of you and I have to keep on reminding people every year. Read the textbook before the class, then you'll know what I'm talking about, then you'll know what extra information I give, that's when you make a note. And then when it comes to the exam, you come back with this and your grade goes up. Read the textbook before the class. Uh, so for example, uh, today when I get started in a couple of minutes, uh, I, I, in every class I, I give you information that's not in the textbook. Sometimes I correct the textbook. Uh, Sometimes I give you extra information about subjects that are not in the textbook. But if you don't read the textbook before the class, and it's not a lot of reading, you can do it on the toilet every morning, you know, just a little bit. Or on the bus to Istanbul, or on the bus coming back from Istanbul. Uh, and then you'll be fully aware of what's going on. Right. Well, today's two hours classes, I'm going to uh, finish off with architecture and art of the Hadrianic period. <clears throat> now remember, I, I've completely reconstructed this course, so I don't quite know how far I'm going to get. Uh, so I may stop a bit early, I may finish a bit late, I don't know which yet. Uh, what I want to start off though, is, is to make this point that the evidence is that Hadrian did not like Rome. This is why he builds the villa at Tivoli. It's outside of Rome. He doesn't want to live in the Domus Augustiana. Uh, the people of Rome seem to, well, they didn't especially like him, but they didn't dislike him. But certainly some of the older senators in Rome were not particularly fond of uh, young Hadrian as an emperor. But even though he wasn't particularly fond of Rome, he was responsible for building three of the most magnificent pieces of architecture of the Roman period, the Roman imperial period, two of which still survive in incredibly good condition. And this first hour I'm going to be looking at these in quite some detail. And I will be giving you details that are not in the textbook, so do be aware of that. Well, the most obvious one to start off by looking at is the one we know as the Pantheon, always known as the Pantheon in the Campus Martius up here. The original Pantheon was a temple built by Agrippa, probably in about 25 BC. Um, the name Pantheon uh, literally means to all the gods or of all the gods. Uh, we know from descriptions that there were statues of uh, Julius Caesar and the gods in the original Pantheon. But it, the actual meaning might really be a, a, just a holy place. This is a holy space. A place sacred to the gods, all the gods. Uh, that original Pantheon was damaged by a fire in the reign of Domitian. It was repaired and, um, by Trajan and then destroyed after, by another fire after being hit by lightning. And there's a bit of argument about this. Some people think that the Pantheon, as we see it today, was started while Trajan was still alive. It's a Trajanic building, not a Hadrianic building. That theory hasn't been totally accepted. But just be aware of that possibility. I'm just going to treat it like everybody else does as a Hadrianic building. Hadrian's Pantheon, though, was not a temple. This is a very important uh, thing to be aware of. Uh, it was an audience hall, a reception hall, um, a kind of like a big state uh, hall, like in, um, not so much Top Kappa Sarai, but Dolma Bacha Sarai, that big audience hall where the Sultan used to sit, receiving ambassadors and people like that. Fortunately for us, 
the Pantheon was converted into a church in the year 608. Most of the interior was stripped out at one point or another, um, but, and it was replaced in the Renaissance period, but it does mean that we have what is, without a doubt, a masterpiece of Roman architecture and a masterpiece of concrete architecture. Well, let's put the Pantheon in its context, because this is something you need to be aware of to understand the mystery of the Pantheon. Agrippa's Pantheon here, Hadrian's Pantheon built right on the top. You can see it's right next to the Septa Julia. A colonnaded space built or begun by Julius Caesar, which would have had a high wall along one side. We're not quite certain what was on the other side, but you've got the Baths of Nero there. This is what the Pantheon looks like uh, from the front. Uh, this is how we tend to see it in, in many ways. Uh, looks rather like a temple. Uh, what we see now, though, is only part of what existed as a complete complex. The Pantheon, a circular building with a temple-like porch on the front, a colonnade in front of it with a triumphal arch in, and also a building at the back. Because the point is that this particular structure was revolutionary. It's 43.2 metres diameter, internal diameter, that rotunda. And the architects who designed this, a very sophisticated piece of architecture, were still a little bit worried that it might fall over. So the porch at the front actually works as a buttress to stop it from slipping. The Campus Martius, there were earthquakes in Rome, the Campus Martius is rather soft ground. So this porch was originally rather like a buttress. Notice incidentally all these holes here. Originally there was a massive bronze decoration and you can just see the stain that was left of a, an eagle inside a reef decorating uh, the front of it. Notice also it has the name of Agrippa on it. Hadrian was uh, remarkable in the sense that he only ever put his name on one building. All the other emperors put names on their building. Hadrian wanted the memory of Marcus Agrippa, Agrippa to be remembered in this particular context. Well, from those traces that we can see in the pediment, we can restore that the facade must have looked something like this, and you've got some idea of the scale here. Now note, there are steps here because the ground level today is two metres higher than it used to be. But a porch is a dramatic piece of um, architecture. It, it makes you think, let's just go back a bit uh, to here, it makes you think rather like one of the imperial fora. The forum of Julius Caesar, the forum of Augustus, um, with the temple at the end of the colonnaded square. This is what it's meant to do, but it is a buttress as well. Now this slide is deliberately upside down because I want to keep the porch on the left hand side for you when you're looking at the slides. Uh, so you've got a porch here and then at the back you've got this thing called the Basilica Neptuna. The Basilica Neptuna does the same thing as the porch. It holds the structure up. And although most of the Basilica Neptuna has gone, not an awful lot of it, Gelato. Do you want an ice cream? Right, basic Italian. Gelato. Ice cream. Okay? Remember that one. Uh, there's hardly anything left of the Basilica Neptuno, just a bits of the decoration, but it's served its purpose very well. The Pantheon has been standing for more than 1,800 years. Well, let's have a look at the Pantheon in more detail. Name of Marcus Agrippa on the front giving his official titles as well. Notice, as I pointed out, that the ground level now is approximately two metres higher than it used to be. Now, when you look at this, you think it looks rather squashed, doesn't it? Yeah. It looks like somebody's come along and gone, eh. There's not really a sense of proportion. You expect Roman temples to go up in the air like that. This one doesn't. And even when you make allowance for the fact that the ground level is two metres high, it still doesn't really go soaring up. Well, there's a very good reason for this. Uh, can we, you can just about see part of the evidence there. But the evidence is that the Pantheon was actually designed to have 
a higher pediment. When they built the rotunda and the porch in front of it, they built this part of the pediment and they never got round to building the rest. So the pediment, as we see it now, is supported on columns of Egyptian granite, grey granite at the front, red granite inside, which are 14.5 metres high. But originally, it was designed with this higher pediment to be built with columns that are 18.1 metres high. The capital was two metres of that. What's happened? A ship must have sunk coming from Egypt to Rome. They don't have enough columns. There are 16 columns in this. The architect doesn't have enough columns to build it like this. Hadrian said, hey, come on, get on with it. But we don't have enough columns, sir. I can't wait another six months. Get on with it, that type of thing. You can see, this is actually what happened. There can be no doubt about that. This is what it was designed to look like. There's the pediment line. That's how it was actually built. So the, the end result being basically that the architect had to adapt the design. Well, it's the porch. Now, going into this porch is really, this is completely traditional in appearance. Now, when the colonnade was in existence in front of the Pantheon, you wouldn't really have any idea of what there was once you went through that porch which is an enormous circular space. It's really impossible to capture this in a photograph. This is the best I've been able to get. There's a wonderful painting by Panini, which was done in um, 1750 or thereabouts, which gives you a much better idea. Uh, who's been to the Hagia Sophia? Oh, a few of you sort of admit you've been there, right. Well, going into the Hagia Sophia, you know, you go, wow, look at that dome up there. The dome of the Hagia Sophia is only 34 metres diameter. It's not actually quite a dome, it's an oblong, it's an oval. This is 43 metres. The dome of the Hagia Sophia is roughly 35, 40 metres above ground level. This is 43 metres high. When you go into the Pantheon, you just go, oh, wow like that, you can't help but go well. I hate giving this class actually, because it destroys it for you when you do get there, when you eventually get to Rome and have a look at this. So you've got this enormous circular space. You have no idea there's this big circular space behind the temple facade, because you can't see from the side what you've got there. And once you get inside the circular space, the rotunda, you find yourself in this incredibly remarkable building which has got a dome exactly 43.2 metres high, and it's exactly 43.2 metres in diameter. So a sphere will fit inside the actual dome there. The dome springs or starts exactly halfway up. So at this cornice level here. So it really is an incredible piece of construction. Uh, the dome itself is surprising in many ways in that it is still standing. It's got these massive foundations which is something like six meters deep. The Campus Martius is an area of soft soil which is still waterlogged. There's still a lot of water in it. Remember when Mussolini excavated the Aurapakis? He had to freeze the ground to get the bits and pieces of the building out. Otherwise, with the water coming in, the whole, th the Renaissance buildings would have collapsed. The Campus Martius is like a jelly in an earthquake. Mm. It goes wobble, wobble, wobble. So you've got these massive foundations, and then you've got this uh, rotunda, brick phase concrete rotunda, originally covered with stucco on the exterior with marble on the interior. The maximum thickness of the walls is six metres, a little bit over six metres. But the wall thickness is narrowed in several places uh, for various reasons. I mean, look, in several places, it's only, it's only about a metre or so thick. You've got these hexedra, rectangular, semicircular, rectangular, apse, rectangular, semicircular, rectangular. 
you've got these voids, some of which have got stairways going in them. So this building sits on not really that big foundations, but if you think about it, you've got these solid piers like that. They're not completely solid, but these are the main supports of the whole uh, Pantheon Dome. I put this one on just to give you some idea of the process involved in planning this. Now today, to plan anything uh, is so easy with a computer and AutoCAD and stuff like that. But somebody had to sit down and work out the square root of this and the square root of that and put the whole thing together in such a perfect way. It's not exactly perfect. You can see the columns are slightly offline. But that column there was replaced by the Emperor Septimius Severus after it collapsed in an earthquake. Um, but you can see how everything all fits in. Isn't that amazing? You know, ancient building technology was incredibly advanced. Forget the pyramids, they're nothing compared to Roman concrete architecture. Well, it's what you have on the inside. You've got this lower level here with the uh, entablature up there. You've got that huge semicircular apse at one end, which is presumably where the Emperor Hadrian would have sat and emperors after him. Then you've got this series of square and semicircular exedra going around it. The marble decoration we see here uh, was put up in the Renaissance period. Uh, for some obscure reason, when the um, owners of the church looked at this in the Renaissance period, they decided it was late Roman, it wasn't really Roman or something like that. So they took down the existing decoration, not realising it was the original Hadrianic decoration, and put this back up. But you get the general idea of what it would have looked like. There are tombs in some of these exedra now, but even so, under Hadrian, then you can imagine they would have been filled with statues like this. The Exedra himself have got these wonderful columns and pilasters on either side, Corinthian order, as you can see there, of yellow Antico marble, which is my favourite marble. Uh, yellow Antico uh, comes from a place called uh, Chimichua in ch modern Tunisia. Um, it was an imperial marble quarry worked by slaves and it really is a, a beautiful yellow stone. But it's very difficult to actually make a column in this. It's a rather sort of flaky stone. So when you look at these columns here, <coughs> these are incredible pieces of architecture. This view gives you a better impression of what the yellow uh, actually looked like. Then above this, um, this column, you've got the, the entablature here, again inlaid with marble. Um, this seems to be more or less a mainly original Roman work with these openings going back like that. And then you've got the cornice. And this is exactly the halfway point in the building. And this is where the dome starts going. Well, the, the dome itself, as I've already indicated, it's a perfect two dome. It's a half sphere, equal in height uh, to its diameter. It really is one of the wonders of the ancient world. It is still the largest self-supporting half dome anywhere in the world, right? Built in 128. I've heard reports of a half dome of concrete, steel reinforced concrete in Paris, which is bigger. I've not seen that, but this is not steel reinforced. This is pure concrete. The weight of this dome also makes you blink. The calculated weight of the dome is 5,000 tonnes. Huh, what's 5,000 tonnes? Imagine 4,000 elephants. Yeah, that's roughly 5,000 tonnes. That's a lot of elephants, isn't it? Sitting on top of these walls like that. It is really is absolutely incredible. How does it still stand? Well, partly the design. You've got a series of coffers on the inside and the dome on the outside is stepped up. But the, uh, and it's stepped up in such a way so that the, it's about six meters wide there. But by the time you actually get to the oculus at the top, the thickness of the uh, dome is only about one and a half meters, something like that. 
It's also made with different types of aggregate, rubble in, in the concrete. So that for the lowest part, you've got ordinary stones and bits and pieces like that. Then you've got pieces of tile and brick. And then towards the top, you've got pieces of volcanic tuff and pumice. Pumice, that grey volcanic stone you can use in the bath for removing hard skin from your feet and things like that. And it floats in the bath, the great thing about pumice. So you've got that added advantage. So you've got these combinations of things. Now let's just look at the outside. I would like to give shocking photographs of structures. I said earlier that anybody coming toward the Pantheon, when it was complete, in context, you wouldn't really see this circular part of the building. The Septijulia is here. The Basilica Neptuna would have been up here, so you wouldn't really see this. But here you can see the step covering, the lead covering of the uh, roof of the dome. Uh, here's another lovely view given it to you. Uh, these steps going up here are original. Now the modern covering of the dome is lead. We're told that Const Constantius II, I think it was, took marble tiles from the Pantheon, from Rome to Constantinople. What we don't know is whether those marble tiles came from the dome or whether they came uh, from the porch. Incidentally, if you know the right people, don't do this at home. I mean, it's, it's a very scaring experience, especially when you get to the Oculus, because you've only got that little rail around the top. And the Oculus, uh, up here, which is um, eight meters in diameter. The other thing that makes the dome light, and the oculus helps make it light, is this coffering on the inside. Coffering, remember, is this system of reducing the thickness of the dome, like that. But look at how this coffering <coughs> is done. Can you see it's quite shallow on the bottom edge, and it gets deeper towards the top, at the middle and the top. Uh, there's 28 coffers in five rows, and they're designed in this particular way, shallow at the bottom, deep at the top, because it gives you the optical illusion that the dome is actually wider and higher than it really is. So, a superb piece of uh, workmanship. Well then, at the top we've got the oculus, just over eight metres in diameter. There's a series of bronze hooks hanging around this on the inside. So there must have been streamers coming from that. But this is really sort of one of the most dramatic parts of the whole structure. It's got a, a structural function in one sense. Uh, yes, it provides light to the interior, but it takes up 4% of the dome surface, so it reduces the weight of the dome as well. This, all this sits on top of this incredibly thin wall. How does it do it? Well, concrete architecture, partly to, to, to explain the story, makes the dome much lighter, although we're still talking about 5,000 elephants in that dome. But it's got this incredible series of relieving arches within the structure. All of these relieving arches have this specific function Remember what the purpose of an arch is. It's to direct the weight and pressure down onto something solid or reasonably solid. So all of these relieving arches push the weight down here onto this pier. This pushes it down onto that pier like that. And you can see these relieving arches uh, quite clearly on the exterior uh, as we see it there. This is really an astounding piece of architecture. The stability of the structure in an area of earthquake activity with a dome weighing 5,000 elephants depends on brick and concrete construction and the use of all those arches. Now, when completed, the exterior was covered with stucco. And there's an article in the current Journal of Roman Archaeology, which I still haven't got time to got around to reading, even though it came in December, which re restores the actual stucco pattern in. The interior, of course, covered with different types of uh, marble. Incredible building, and made even more incredible if you can just go there and wait a whole day. 
because you start off with the sunlight coming in like this, with the birds and the rain, whenever necessary, moves over to the centre at midday. Out of the way, lady! Thank you very much. Um, the closer you get, of course, to June, the closer that circle actually gets to the centre. But just looking from the porch towards the uh, uh, apps there. And then it starts to go up on the other side in the evening, going, of course, from uh, east to um, west to east. This is really a truly remarkable building. It's been standing for more than 1,800 years. It's still in pretty much its original condition. As I said earlier, it's still the largest single self-supporting dome. St. Peter's Dome and the Vatican in Rome is almost as big. Michelangelo deliberately did not make it as big as this. But the one in St. Peter's is not the self-supporting. It's got all sorts of extra uh, braces inside it. Well, when you think about the Pantheon in this respect, and remember, or rather... Uh, you, you've got these bronze hooks around the oculus. They must have had fabric hanging down from them, different coloured fabrics, silks, linens, that sort of thing. All the coffers here originally painted blue. And it seemed probably with a bronze star. So you can imagine, or you can understand why this was Hadrian's favourite building. And you can imagine the effect it must have had on visitors coming to meet the emperor, Hadrian or any other emperor, you're taken to Rome, your first visit to Rome, you're taken to the Campus Martius, you're taken to what seems to be a temple, and you think, oh, this is rather strange. And you go inside, and you go, wow, and there the emperor is sitting at the other end. The second really great example of architecture, Hadrianic architecture in Rome, is the least well preserved. And this is the Temple of Venus and Roma uh, down here. Um, in between the Roman Forum and the Flavian Amphitheatre. There was a piece of high land there, and the brick gate, um, the brick stamps indicate that work began on this probably in 123. We don't exactly know or don't know exactly when the Pantheon was started. The brick stamps in the lower levels of the Pantheon have got Trajanic dates on them. That's why some people think it might actually be a building designed by Apollodorus. It might be Trajanic. But the Pantheon is finished off under Hadrian. The brick stamps on the top date to about 128. This, the brick stamps indicate work uh, began sometime around 123. Coins indicate that it was dedicated, formally dedicated and open uh, for use in 123, uh, sorry, 132. But other coins reveal that the final touches were done in 140 by the next emperor, the Antoninus Pius. The reason it took so long to build is that this is the largest temple in Rome. It covers an area of about 100 by 70 metres. Well, this view taken from the Flavian Amphitheatre, there's the Arch of Titus, gives you some idea of the size of this particular structure. And you've got lots of little people in the foreground to give you a scale. Basically, you've got an enormous brick-built platform with all these barrel vaults going underneath. Remember, this is the great advantage of barrel vaults and concrete architecture. It cuts the cost of building things. You don't have to train people. You don't have to put lots of material in there. You just make barrel vaults. The temple platform it's properly known as the Temenos, the sacred area. And you can see you've got these um, openings here. Uh, we know that at a later date, these were used for storing machinery for use in the Flavian Amphitheatre. We don't know what kind of machinery, though. This is what the temple was originally looked like. It, apart from its size, what we have to take into account here is that this temple represents a very clever adaptation of the demands of Roman tradition and the difficulties of building a temple in a narrow space. The space available to build this temple was 145 metres from west to east and 100 metres from north to south. 
Roman tradition said that a temple should face either east or west, preferably east. Hadrian wants to build a temple to two goddesses, Venus and Roma. Venus on this side and Roma on that side. Well, normally you would get around this problem by building a wide temple with two separate shrines at the end for the two goddesses. But Hadrian wants this to be the biggest temple in Rome. So he or his architects come up with this novel solution. They build a temple which is back to back. One half of the temple faces the west, the other half of the temple uh, faces towards the east. Venus faces the east and Roma faces west. Well, the temple, as I said, the Temenos does stand on this uh, enormous platform. And it's thanks to this platform that we know about some of the Domus Transitorium. Because at the other end, in this part of the building here, by the way, this is a later rebuilding, but this represents the halfway point. So, you know, you're not looking at the full Temenos. On the other side of here, the foundations incorporate a part of the uh, Domus Transitorium. Well, as I indicated, whoops, going the wrong way there, the, what you see now is a rebuilding to a certain extent. We do know that the main entrance to the temple was from this side, from the Roman Forum side. There were side entrances, one facing towards the Esquiline Hill, the other facing towards the uh, Palatine Hill. There were two entrances from the Flavian, Empath um, Flavian Amphitheatre and... Uh, the only surviving parts that we have of the Hadrianic building, unfortunately, are these columns going along that wall there. This is the way you go from the Arch of Titus to get to the Flavian Amphitheatre or Colosseum uh, in the background there. The temple was destroyed in a fire in the second, um, late 2nd, early 3rd century. And so what you actually see there now is a 3rd century rebuilding. So, and I think the textbook does not make this clear, nor does the textbook make it clear that the plan in the textbook is of the 3rd century rebuilding, not the original Hadrianic temple. Now, when I went through these slides just before I came here, I realised I got them the wrong way around. Uh, in other words, north is down there instead of being up there. But this is the plan of the rebuilt temple. It's still that double uh, concept. Um, that we see in the original version. The excavation tells us a lot about the temple. So we know it was Deca style. Ten columns at the front. We know it had a double row of columns along the sides, three rows of columns along the front and the back. We know that the actual temple itself is 50 by 30 metres or so. The columns were 18.1 metres high, Corinthian capitals made of white marble, the rest of the structure being the usual brick and concrete. We can get some idea of what it looked like from this. This is the Temple of Zeus Olympios, which Hadrian completely rebuilt uh, in Athens. You've got the Parthenon in the background, and you've got that horrible person there providing a scale for you. These are the same sort of columns, 18.1 metres high, total height with those Corinthian columns. It's the same type of temple, but just look how massive it is. And now, of course, you see nothing that represents that particular glory there. We also have images of the temple on coins confirming its Deca style um, and indicating that there must have been sculptures in the pediment but we can't be exactly certain what they were. Now one last thing to note about this particular structure. Remember how I told you that Apollodorus was executed by Hadrian for making fun of him? Our source for this piece of information is a third century Roman writer called Cassius Dio. Cassius Dio tells us Apollodorus was executed because Hadrian came running up to him one day with some drawings. Now I told you about the pumpkin part. Before the pumpkin part, 
is what's important. These drawings were of Hadrian's own design for the Temple of Venus and Roma. He shows them to Apollodorus. Apollodorus says, well, the temple's in a valley. You should build it on a higher base to make it dominate everything. And you've got the proportions all wrong because it's not high enough for the statues of the gods you want to put inside there. If the gods decide to stand up, their heads will go through the roof of the temple. So why don't you go away and draw your pumpkins? Forget temple design, leave it to the experts. That's how we know that Hadrian was personally involved in the, um, in the, the design process of this temple. This is how we know, of course, the pumpkins I've already referred to. We know about Hadrian's interest in that particular architectural device as well. So we can get some idea of what it looked like. It's such a pity that nothing really survives of it because this must have really been a superb structure. But it makes an amazing contrast. Think. The Pantheon is a completely new type of building combining that rotunda with a Roman invention, a dome, and a traditional octo-style eight-column porch on the front. Brick and concrete. This is purely classical. It's going back to Greek tradition. The plan is that of a Greek temple, although it's back to back, but it's got that central building. It's on a uh, platform with steps going around it. It doesn't have the frontal steps that you find with a Roman temple. It's a Greek temple. Hadrian, Greculus. Never forget that particular point there. Well, the, the third of the buildings that um, Hadrian was responsible for at Rome, which we can still see, but not in such good condition as the, um, uh, the Pantheon over there, was the mausoleum he had built for his own burial. With the death of the Emperor Nerva, the last available space in the mausoleum of Augustus was filled. So then uh, the Emperor Trajan, his ashes were buried in the base of the column, Trajan's column. So Hadrian builds this, and this is going to be um, the mausoleum for himself and for everybody after him. It's on the other side of the river Tiber, and there's this wonderful postcard that you can buy in Rome which shows you that's Hadrian's mausoleum, what survives of it, and there's Vatican City there, the smallest state in uh, modern Europe. Uh, once upon a time, there was a beautiful Constantinian basilica there until some guy called Michelangelo designed this new thing that went up on top of it. To get over there, Hadrian built this lovely little bridge, the Pons Hadriani. The mausoleum survives because it was converted into a fortress to def defend the, the Vatican. Castel San Angelo, after the uh, angel figure that you see on the top dominating there. Well, these alterations have really obscured a lot of the original appearance. You can see that's original Roman masonry there, but this is Renaissance masonry. The, um, the holes there for the canon connect this building to the Pantheon, because the Pope at the time took all the bronze work from the Pantheon and melted it down to make canon to put in there. Mm, nasty, horrible Pope. But analysis, building analysis, tells us quite a lot about the structure. Again, We've got a platform, a barrel vaulted platform. We've got this uh, circular drum on top of it, 64 meters in diameter. A central tower type structure, rather like the Muslim of Augustus. And the indications are that this was probably covered with earth to make a tumulus type thing as well. Coming in from the entrance, a series of ramps take you up uh, to the main burial chamber there, like that, and with the Emperor Hadrian being buried in that central part. Later emperors, the last emperor to be buried there was Caracalla, who died in 217. I think that's just about time, isn't it? Da, 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 da. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to stop there because otherwise I'll um, get into the next bit.
and then you'll have to go away and remember what I said. Off you go.